I want to thank everyone for coming out today. I really appreciate it. I know everyone's really busy, so uh, I'll certainly do my best to make it worth your while. So as Dan talked about, what we really want to focus on here is uh, how do we actually use our skills in C-Sharp and .NET and leverage Xamarin so we can really build real-life cross-platform mobile apps. Right? We know that historically, when we try to build cross-platform, we're kind of almost always giving something up. And one of the things that we find with Xamarin is that it's, um, it's one of the few tools, excuse me, few, few tools out there that enable us to actually build cross-platform applications without giving something up. Right? So let's look at what we're going to talk about throughout this talk. And what I find is that working with Xamarin, there's kind of three really big questions that people ask me about it. And so that's what we're going to focus on is kind of answering those questions. Okay, so the first question people really ask or commonly ask is, what is Xamarin? What is it? Excuse me. <clears throat> what is Xamarin? The next thing is that, excuse me, a drink of water. <clears throat> Sorry about that. The next question they ask is, can I share application code across platforms? Can I really do it? And then the last question I commonly get is, will a single code base run on both platforms? All right, so those are the questions we're going to ask. So now if you're in a hurry, here's the answers really quickly. Right? What is Xamarin? Well, it's a .NET tool and environment. For Android and iOS. Can you share application code across platforms? Yes, you can. Will a single code base run on both platforms? No, not normally. Yeah, there's maybe a few kind of really, really simple things you might try and do where a single code base will run across both platforms. But in reality, you are going to have platform specific code, right? Xamarin is not one of those environments that tries to create this really high level abstraction through something like HTML or something so that you're not really looking at the platform. The power of Xamarin comes from the fact is that it does not try to hide the platform. It enables you to really leverage the full features of the platform. Right, so let's go through each of these questions in more detail throughout this talk. Now, the first big one, of course, is what is Xamarin? Right, now, you've probably heard something about it. It's got a ton of press lately. Right, kind of uh, back, I think it was November, December, they did a partnership with Microsoft. That gave them a lot more notoriety. So you've probably heard something about Xamarin. But there's also a lot of confusion about what is the relationship between Xamarin, Microsoft.net, and this other thing called Mono. Right? And Mono is a term that's been around for a long time. Right? So let's look at each one. Right? Is that kind of, you know, kind of in the beginning, right, back around 2000, 2001, on the Windows platform, right, Microsoft introduced Microsoft.net. Right? And that's the .net that we all know and love. Right? So along with that, because .net was always intended to be um, cross-platform. On Linux, there was a project called Mono Project. Right? And so the Mono Project actually was this kind of first attempt to bring .NET onto the platform, the Linux platform. And kind of as an extension of that, we have two other platforms, right, iOS and Android. Now, both iOS and Android are both Unix-based platforms, right? Android is actually Linux-based, and iOS is, I believe, a BSD Unix-based. Right? But they were natural extensions of the Mono Project. And so there was something called Mono Touch, which was .NET or the Mono environment extended to iOS, and then Mono for Android. Right? Now, these environments were all free software, open source license, right? So there's something you could go out and use. And one of the things you'll find is that in the early days of Mono, um, it tended to lag the .NET environment uh, pretty substantially. They were doing a pretty good job, but they couldn't really keep up. And part of the problem with that is that they weren't well funded, right? And so without the money, they couldn't build a big team. You know, porting .NET to other platforms is a big project. And so that's kind of where they started. Well, Monotouch eventually evolved what we call Xamarin iOS. That's the Xamarin environment we have today for iOS. And also for Android, we have Xamarin Android. The key thing is that these are both commercially licensed products. In other words, if you're going to build apps for real, these are things that you pay for. Right? There's some kind of, there are some free entry points, but largely there's something you pay for. And one of the things I've seen uh, frequently asked around the Internet is that, well, why would I pay for Xamarin iOS if Monotouch is free? Or why would I pay for Xamarin Android if Monotouch Android is free? And the thing is, those guys are gone. Right? So the completely free, unlimited license use uh, environment for Xamarin on Android and iOS, those guys are gone. Now, the key thing is that they still kind of have share a link with the Monotouch for, for Linux. The thing is that they really kind of fund the project now. Because these are actually commercial projects, Xamarin is really an a well-funded company that works at an incredible pace to keep up. In most environments, you'll find that when a new version of .NET comes out, Xamarin's right there on the same day. 
when a new version of iOS comes out, Xamarin is updated to deal with it on the same day. Even in the Android environment, they keep up really well. And in fact, um, I do work with uh, Google Glass as well, right? And I've, I built projects with Xamarin for Google Glass. And literally, when an updated Glass development kit came out, I'm not sure if it was the same day, but certainly within a day or two, Xamarin had the updated Google development kit available, right? So as a funded project, they are able to move so well, and they're such a high-quality environment. that You'll find that Xamarin really, really is .NET for these other platforms. Now, when you're working in Xamarin, kind of one of the biggest things that come up is that, well, what tools do I use to build projects for Xamarin? And now, the specific tools you use depend on what edition of Xamarin you have, right? The different levels of Xamarin product are referred to as editions. And there is a starter edition, and that is free. Right, and it does give you the real environment. Uh, there's some limitations, uh, kind of what you're allowed to do with it. Uh, in terms of the environment, is the real Xamarin.NET environment. Then there's what's called the Indie uh, Edition. Um, that is a four-pay edition, which you pay for it. Uh, and it's really based on, intended for small companies, either individual developers or just a few developers. If you're working in either of those environments, you are uh, using Xamarin Studio. Right? Basically, the development environment that Xamarin provides. It feels a lot like Visual Studio. It doesn't have all the power that Visual Studio, but if you know Visual Studio, it's an incredibly envir uh, familiar environment. Now, if you move to the higher-end editions, the business edition and the enterprise edition, so they're uh, slightly more expensive, and they're kind of really much more unlimited use, unlimited team size. Uh, commercial work that I do, I commonly do with the business edition. Okay? Basically, these introduce Visual Studio support. Now, all the way up through business edition and enterprise edition, if you like Xamarin Studio, you can still use Xamarin Studio. But I find that most times, you know, I really like the Visual Studio environment, so I use Visual Studio for pretty much all of my Xamarin work. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, though, too, is that the Visual Studio project file layout and solution file layout is fully understood and compatible with Xamarin Studio. Right? So if you have some reason that you need to work in Visual Studio most of the time, but i got to switch to Xamarin Studio for a little about while and then come back to Visual Studio, you can completely do that. I have done it. Uh, the environments are incredibly compatible. They do really well moving back and forth with one another. So now, when I use these tools, what is my development environment like? Right? What do I, how do I work? What do I do? Well, it depends a little bit on which tool set you're using. Now, if you're working in Xamarin Studio, when you do your Android development, you can do it on Windows or OS X on Mac. Right? And basically, Xamarin Studio and Xamarin in general leverages the real underlying platforms, right? So when you're working with Android, you, it actually, Xamarin actually installs the standard Android tools underneath, the Android environment underneath. So Xamarin's really kind of communicating that with that. So because uh, Android tools are available on both Windows and OS X, well, Android, or excuse me, Xamarin leverages that, lets you work with whatever environment you prefer. But in uh, iOS, the iOS, uh, you must use iOS for your Xamarin development, which states, I'm sorry, you must use OS X for your Xamarin development for iOS. But the iOS tools are only available on OS X. So that's what Xamarin Studio, or Xamarin is just really limited to, right? So you basically just fire up the Xamarin Studio environment, whichever platform you're working on, and you do your work. Now, Visual Studio is a little bit different, right? We know that Visual Studio is a Windows-only product, right? Microsoft provides Visual Studio running on Windows. So when you do your Android development with Visual Studio, you do it on Windows. Right? It, that makes sense. But we now think a little bit about the iOS side of things, right? If the iOS tools are only available on OS X and Xamarin leverages those built-in tools, how do we use tool like Visual Studio so that it runs on Windows? Well, what happens is that we do our work in Visual Studio on our Windows machine, but then Xamarin will link up to an OS X computer to actually do the building work. Right, so let's see what those two environments look like from Visual Studio. Right, so if I'm going to do Android work, right, I'm going to do all my work in Windows. Right, so I'm going to fire Visual Studio. I'm going to use the Visual Studio Code Editor. Right, so I have that there. And that's a very familiar environment. And what happens is that when I install Xamarin, it just provides extended capability. Right, so it provides a UI designer for laying out Android, uh, Android environments or Android UIs. It manages our compiling. Now, it still uses tools under the covers that Android relies on, right? So it's still using that Android tool set to actually build your ADB because it, it really is 
an Android package in the end, right? You can put it out through Google Play. It's really largely indistinguishable from a standard Android application, right, uh, in a general sense. There's some details about how things work under the covers, but it is an Android app. And it also matters our debugging experience. But again, leveraging the standard way of doing things. Whenever you work with Android, there's an environment called the ADB server, and that's kind of your key linkage from your development environment into your application so you can debug it and test it. Okay. So basically, Xamarin hooks Visual Studio into the ADB server, so you can then use the same Android emulators you would use if you're working in a traditional Android environment, and you can also just link up to Android devices. Right? All that works just as easily or as effectively as you're working in Android, but it's that familiar Visual Studio experience, right? So you're walking through into the debugger, all those things feel normal, right? So that's kind of what you might expect. Now, on the iOS side, it's a little bit more involved, again, because of that need to leverage the iOS tools that only run on Mac, on OS X, right? So if you're looking at doing your work, right, obviously, you're going to be using Visual Studio that's on Windows. You're still going to use that same Visual Studio code editor you're used to, but now, OS X gets involved. Now, up until the most recent release of Xamarin, Xamarin 3, when it came time to design your user interface, you basically had to go over to OS X, fire up Xamarin Studio. That would then cooperate with the standard iOS tool set called Xcode. You would actually use that designer, and that would feed that back into Xamarin Studio. And that would actually do the .NET code generation for us. Now, I said, that was up until Xamarin 3 came out, which is just about two weeks ago. Now, there are still a certain environments where you still might have to do this, but in general, that complexity has gone away. With this most recent release of Xamarin, they now have the iOS UI designer directly inside the Visual Studio. So you can actually lay it out. It's what we call the storyboard designer. Right? Is that, if you're familiar with iOS development, there are two ways to do a UI. There's what's called a nib file or a storyboard. If you find you want to use, still want to use nib files, you have to do it the old way over on OS X. But the general trend in iOS development is to move towards storyboards. And that's what we now have inside of Visual Studio is a um, storyboard designer. And that storyboard designer is also inside of Xamarin Studio now. So when you're designing your iOS development or iOS UIs, you no longer have to leave Visual Studio or Xamarin Studio. You can stay in there and do that. And now what happens is in the Visual Studio sense, that is all now linked in as a general extension to it. So you might be thinking that, well, geez, do I really need OSX yet? And the answer is so OSX still. And the answer is yes, you do. When you kick up your compiles in Visual Studio, the Visual Studio environment is actually delegating the compilation. And what happens is that over, you have to have an OSX box, and over on that, you run what's called the Xamarin iOS server. And that basically is a listener that connects up to your Visual Studio environment. So when you do your builds from your Windows computer, it's actually pushing those over to the server, and they run over in the server, and the actual compilation occurs over there. Now, in terms of the uh, experience of building and compiling, you don't even need to be able to see that OS X computer. In fact, often when I'm working in that phase, I actually just kind of put the computer somewhere else in the room. The OS X computer is somewhere else in the room. I don't even need to see it. But now when I get to my debugging experience, and the debugging experience also delegates out over to the uh, uh, Xamarin iOS server. So that actually delegates over to OS X. What that means is that when you're testing your code out, your test experience, although all your debugging and steps and everything happen inside of Visual Studio on Windows, the work is actually happening, the underlying work is actually happening over in OS X. So when you fire up an application for testing with the iOS simulator, that simulator will actually run over on the OS X computer. And if you want to test with a real iOS device, you actually connect the iOS device to the OS X computer, to the Mac. So what you see happening there is that you launch it from Windows, you do your debugging experience from Windows, but the actual code is running through the OS X computer. Right? And that's kind of how Visual Studio links all that up. Now, again, just to be very clear, because Xamarin Studio is not limited to running on Windows, Xamarin Studio can run directly on OS X, right? so you don't have to have that server running. But in the Visual Studio environment, you actually do have to have that server to link it up. And I, I find, I just love Visual Studio. I find the productivity of it really useful. So I find it's kind of really great, effective way to work. But that's not to say that Xamarin Studio is not also a great experience. So if you're not, you're not, don't, you're not in a position where you can spend the money for the higher editions that support Visual Studio, don't feel like you're losing out. Xamarin Studio is still really kind of a high-quality environment. So I want to talk a little bit about the Xamarin philosophy. When I say the Xamarin philosophy, 
This is Zarin philosophy according to me. Right? I'm not talking about a stated printed philosophy from Zarin. Just saying if someone has worked with Zarin for a while, I really find that this philosophy helps them to understand things a lot better. And basically, it's a really simple idea, right, is that basically the work effectively in Xamarin, when you write your code, you share the code that you can, and you don't share the code that you can't. And what that means is that when you're building a cross-platform application, you need to have a clear understanding of what code you're going to share cross-platform and what code is going to be platform-specific. And that's what I mean, right? So the cross-platform code is sharing what you can. The platform-specific code is don't share what you can't, right? And working in Xamarin effectively really requires that you think about that issue and that you understand it, right? So kind of building on that, let's look at the two pieces, doing our cross-platform code and our platform-specific code, right? So we look at sharing code across platforms, right? So basically the first question is always, well, what kind of code can be cross-platform, right? And it really breaks down into kind of three really general categories, right? Business logic, data validation, and the interaction with your backend services. Right, like for example, I'm working on a large project now where we use the parse backend service. Right, and parse is a backend with all the data storage, messaging, so forth. The code that I interact with that is actually I can use it on both platforms. Right, same with business logic. In fact, when we talk about things like business logic and data validation being cross-platform, in most cases that kind of code that you've already written for an ASP.NET application or even a desktop kind of application, most of that code can be just picked up and just dropped right into your Xamarin project and can run right on your iOS or Android environment. Now, when you build this code and you have to separate things out, because remember, we're going to have our cross-platform code and then our platform-specific code, we need to think about what kind of project types we actually use to contain this code. And this is true whether you're using Visual Studio or Xamarin Studio. And basically, you're going to use one of the cross-platform project types, right? So there's a portable project, right, which built an assembly that can go cross-platform, or you identify what platforms to support, there's also the new concept of the shared project, which allows you to leverage pro uh, code across platforms as well. So the idea is that cross-platform code goes into a cross-platform compatible project. Right? That's the idea. So what does it mean to write our shared code? Like, what do we have to think about? Well, our cross-platform code is .NET code. Right? So let's think about something. Let's say that for this talk, we're going to write a really simple uh, cross-platform application. So we're going to have our business logic, and then we'll have our user interface experience, right? So let's say that our application is going to do something really simple, right? A user is going to be able to type in a string, they click a button, and we'll display back to the user the number of uppercase characters in the string, right? So if we say capital H, hello, capital W, world, right, there are two uppercase characters, H and W. So our business logic is the ability to accept the string and then return the number of uppercase characters in it. So we're going to write some uh, class I'm going to call it my silly string class. Right? It has a constructor that accepts the string and stores it. And it's going to have a read-only property called upper count that returns the number of uppercase characters. And if you look at this code, right, this is .NET code. It's the same .NET code you write in HP.NET, you write in the desktop. And that's true. It's Xamarin code. It really is .NET code. And that's the thing I just want to really want you to kind of embrace is that when you're writing Xamarin, you are writing .NET. You're not writing some kind of weird facsimile of .NET. You're writing .NET code. And to kind of really show the power and the kind of completeness of the .NET code we have, let's take our, our upper count uh, property. And remember, that the responsibility here is that we want to return a number of uppercase characters. And of course, one way to do that is that we could write a loop that just walks through the string and just counts the uppercase characters. But we know that in .NET, one of the things that we often do is that we don't write a lot of loops or we don't write as many loops as we used to. We leverage things like link. So let's do that in our business logic, our upper count property. Let's write our implementation to use link to determine the number of uppercase characters in the entered string. And this really shows you how complete Xamarin's implementation of .NET is. These few lines show you a ton about how rich that is. Notice one thing we have there, var x, means we have type, type inference, right? So Xamarin has type inference just like .NET does. We have this rich link experience, right, the from, the from clause, the where clause, the select, right, all those are there, right? Even extension method, right? So what I'm trying to show you is that when you write your code for Xamarin, you're writing real .NET, you're not limited, right? So if you write your cross-platform code, you're going to use all the same classes, all the same collections, all the same features you're used to using in any other .NET development that you do. So now, 
when we build our application, the thing that often comes up, the thing we have to think a lot more about is the platform-specific code. Because the cool thing about Xamarin is that all that, all that shared code is all the stuff you're used to using. But now when we move to the platform-specific stuff, remember that then one of the real powers of Xamarin is that it doesn't try to hide the capabilities of the underlying platform. Right? It really leverages what the platform can do. What that means then is it has to expose those features into your application. So how does it do that? Right? How can it expose those features into our applications if we're using the same .NET classes we use for our traditional .NET work? Well, really, it comes along the fact is that we look thinking about what code, first of all, is platform-specific, right? So we look at, well, there's user interface code is trying to go be platform-specific. When you try to leverage specific platform features, right, things like, for example, like Android has things like activities, uh, things like an underlying concept, things called intents. All those things are platform features or platform services, right? There's a, uh, there's a whole alarm manager inside of Android, right? And iOS has its own messaging layers, right? So when you're interacting with those services and features, that's when you write platform-specific code. You're trying to leverage those capabilities. So then the question is, is that, well, when I'm writing my platform-specific code, what kind of product does that, is that contained in? And basically, for your Android code, you're going to create an Android project. For your iOS code, you're going to create an iOS project. So Xamarin Studio and Visual Studio wants to install Xamarin as Android project types and iOS project types. So you're going to create those. So what happens is that when you build your applications, your cross-platform applications, you're generally going to have three projects, right? The shared code project, and then one project for Android code, one project for iOS code. Now, one thing I want to mention, too, is that although Xamarin itself does not support Windows Phone, because you can use Visual Studio, because it uses .NET, you can still share your code with Windows Phone and iOS and Android. So if you're building a project that requires all three of those platforms, your code will share, your shared code will run across those as well, and then you would just add a, a Windows Phone project to your platform specific along with Android and iOS. Right. But Xamarin itself is, is handling the Android and iOS side of that. So now looking at the types, and we put together the types, there's really this idea that as we're building these platform specific features, how do we get to those? And we get to those by Xamarin providing .NET types for the platform. So what happens is that Xamarin effectively extends the .NET environment is that it adds classes to it, and those classes are specific to the platform. So your Xamarin app will have access to certain types. Actually, I should say your Android app will have access to certain Xamarin types, and your iOS app will have access to certain Xamarin iOS-specific types. So it provides for each platform its own extension of those types. Those types expose the platform capabilities. Right? So in iOS, a real key part of the UI is something called the view controller. So when you're working in Xamarin for iOS, there is a view controller .NET class that exposes the same features as the iOS Objective C view controller class would have, right? So, or like in uh, Android, we use these things called activities a lot. When we're doing building our Android application, there is a Xamarin .NET class called activity that exposes the capability and features of an Android activity. So what that means is that if you're going to be a developer building cross-platform applications you still need to understand the, understand the underlying platforms. I can't say that enough. Xamarin is valuable not because it tries to hide the platform. It's valuable because it embraces and exposes the platform. So you build your applications, your Android apps feel like Android. Your iOS, iOS apps feel like iOS. They behave like iOS. They have full access to capabilities of iOS and Android. That, to me, is a key differentiator to other craft or from other craft cross platform environments. Most of those are I'd say many of those abstract things so much that they tend your apps don't tend to feel natural there, or you have to do a lot of extra work to make them feel natural. Xamarin exposes that directly into your application, yet you do it all as .NET. So now we're building our applications. We're gonna again have one for Android, right, and one for iOS. And so inside of Xamarin Studio and Visual Studio, you have designers. So we're going to the Android designer. So if I'm building out an Android for the Android version of my application, now remember that we said that in this kind of cross-platform app that we're going to build, we would have the user enter a string, so we have an input field, and then when they click a button, we would display the number of uppercase characters, so we have to have a button and an output field. And the way we build that is in the designer, right, the UI of it. So we have a toolbox. The toolbox exposes 
the Android UI types, right? So if you're familiar with Android, there's a concept of view and a bunch of classes that inherit from view. Those classes are in the toolbox. You drag and drop them onto the UI. And you manage the UI in an Android-specific way. So when you work with Android, there's a bunch of layout classes, right? And these layouts control the way the user interface is rendered. Xamarin provides .NET types that expose those layout classes, right? So you can put those right onto our design uh, surface and lay them out that way. But you do all your design work there. And if you work with UIs in Visual Studio for a long time, you're familiar with like a properties window to set these features on your classes. Well, that's how it works here as well, right? And again, these properties are going to be the properties that make sense from an Android standpoint, right? So one of the big things in Android is that each one of your views has to have an ID property I've set on it, right? So we go through and we set those, and that's how we identify the UI inside of there. Now, on the iOS side, right, again, Xamarin Studio and Visual Studio expose an iOS designer. Right? Again, it's going to look very similar, but the controls, features, and experience are going to be very iOS-oriented, right? So we have a toolbox, but that toolbox exposes the iOS control, right? So, again, we have an input field, a button, and an output field, we're using the iOS type for that. And again, we can drag and drop them onto the design service, surface. But in this case, we're going to do it much more in an iOS sort of way, where we actually give it positions and uh, set properties about stretching and how it's behaving in that sense. But we're doing it in a very iOS way. And we have our properties window, and we set the properties on each of those UI controls. But in this case, we're going to do it in an iOS way. Right? So here, instead of having something like an ID, we actually have a name, right? And, and the reason these things are so different is because the underlying platforms manage them so differently, right? Because remember that the iOS and the Android worlds are very different in terms of, of how they think about devices, right? The iOS world is very much about uh, being controlled, right? It's that iOS and Apple actually make sure that most devices run the current version of iOS, right? They don't have other hardware manufacturers, so it's a very narrow set of devices. So iOS is allowed to be a little bit more kind of um, more predictable about its UI, right? In the Android space, right, Android has 80% of the market, right? So Android's got a huge piece of the market. Well, part of that is they offer some lower-end phones, right? And they offer, also offer a wide variety of phones. So there's a lot of differences in the way, the details of the screen size and the capabilities of the Android phones out there that iOS phones don't experience. So Android does that using something called resources, right? So the idea is that in Android, you can describe your UI in kind of five different ways based on different device capabilities. And Android will automatically load the correct resource for you. So in the Android world, it tends to be important to bind your, your code to the UI in kind of a late sense. You want to basically have everything rendered, selected, and then you can bind into it. In the iOS world, because it's more predictable, the whole concept of binding the UI to your code can be done more kind of in an early sense. So in iOS, we have to identify, we provide IDs to find the code, the UI component. In iOS, we can simply almost in effect declare the UI components right away as part of our design experience. And so what that means is that as we work in our application code, when we interact with user interface, we're still going to do it in, very, in a .NET sort of way, but we're going to still embrace the underlying capabilities of the platform. So looking at our access to the UI, right, on the Android side of things, right, remember we said we talked about the fact that these are very resource-based in Android because we have all these different uh, device types out there. We want to go ahead and bind our, our code to the UI in kind of a late sense. So what happens is that when we actually want to get access to the UI components, we actually type the code to do that. We actually enter the code to do that. Right? So the idea is that if we want to get to an edit text, control, right? Well, now you'll notice we're going to go ahead and declare a type like that, right? And notice that edit text is not a standard .NET type. Well, there is a view in Android called edit text. So the Xamarin provides a .NET class called edit text. It provides those underlying features. And then we, then at runtime, we go out and we find on the loaded resource the particular component we want by its ID. And there's something called find UI by ID that we use very often in Android programming, whether we're doing it in standard Android or in Xamarin. We have to say, go ahead and find the view that has an ID. And you'll notice that one thing that Xamarin does is it doesn't just put some kind of thin, bland wrapper over the platform. It actually makes the underlying platform even more .NET-like. 
If you've written traditional Java-based Android code, you know you call find view by ID all the time, and you always have to include a specific cast, right? So if you're, you're getting an edit text, you have to explicitly cast it to edit text. Well, .NET has generics, right? So one of the things that Xamarin does is provide a find view by ID method that accepts a generic argument. So you just specify the type there. So you're not doing explicit cast. It's actually using the generic to bring it in. So it's making the underlying environment more like .NET. And then we just, again, still access the resources to identify the individual control or view that we put on the UI, right? And we basically go through and just do that for each of the UI components we have to interact with, right? Again, so because Android's UI model is much more about late binding in order to deal with all those device differences. Right? On the iOS side, if we look at our how we access our UI components, the code that actually ties our code to the UI is actually generated code. In other words, we don't have to declare in our code explicitly the variables that tie to the UI because it's actually generated for us, again, because iOS kind of has that concept built into it, right? And if you work in iOS natively, you're familiar with something called outlets, right? Outlets allow you to take a UI control and link it up to code through something called an outlet. Well, Xamarin generates that same sort of thing. And again, Xamarin introduces things and types into the environment that embrace underlying iOS. You notice that here are actually attributes that are not standard parts of Android or of, uh, .NET, but Xamarin's them. So there's actually an outlet attribute that identifies that this is acting as an outlet. Right? And an outlet, again, in iOS is a link of a code type to the UI. And then it introduces an actual properties for each one. So UI view is not a normal .NET type. It's actually one added because UI view or what UI, or the UI component type in iOS, right? And so that's our experience, is that we're managing and interacting with the environment consistent with the underlying platform. So we, for each UI control, we get a property that ties into it. So now, understanding that, we've kind of looked at two different sides of the issue, right? Is that we know that we wrote our shared code, and we're going to do that very much like traditional .NET. And then we're also going to have our platform-specific code that is still very .NET, but embraces the underlying platform. All right, the next one I want to look at is that, well, how do we bring all that together? And I just want to remind everyone is that if you have questions about things we're talking about, please go ahead and send them along, right? You can have your questions either in the chat window or you can actually, through Twitter, send them to Pluralsight with hashtag Pluralsight Live, right? In either case, uh, if you have questions, send them along because we're going to spend time at the end answering questions, right? So now looking at how we bring our code together, on the Android side, Right. We take that resource that we've created there. We now have our UI. Remember, what we're doing here is we're having the user enter a string, click a button, and then we just display back to them how many uppercase characters are in that string. And so then our code is going to tie all this together. Right. Let's take a look at it. Right. Is that remember that we want to interact with that button right, because we want to handle the click event on that button. Right. So we want to get to the button. So what we're going to do then is declare our button variable, in this case it's going to be a field. We're going to identify the resource ID. When we laid it out, we gave each UI component a resource ID. That, that finds it for us. We link them up. And then once we have that button, one of the things that uh, Xamarin does is that for all the events that that control can, can fire, it actually provides .NET events. Because you know that in, in the Java environment, the native Android environment, .NET style events don't exist. Right? We have to actually hook them up in a kind of a more contrived, I don't say contrived, but just a very different way. Right? In Xamarin, we do it just very .NET like. There's actually event types for all this. We just do a standard plus equals and a delegate and link it right up. So we can send it off to a method, right? And we just go ahead and describe our delegate right in place there. Right? And so that's what I've done here. So then now we can handle the button clicks. When the user clicks the uh, button, our delegate's going to run. Well, what do we have to do? Right? We have to go ahead and get the user's input string. So we can do that by having our edit text all right, we declare the input text. We use our find view by D. Excuse me, find view by ID. Now we've got a reference to that underlying view in our code. And now, now our business logic comes in. Remember, our business logic was to determine the number of uppercase characters. So we go in here and we use our silly string. Remember, that's the cross-platform code that we wrote. All right, so we just go ahead and have that there. And notice that when we knew it up. We can access properties on those controls. You notice, remember that native or Android development is normally Java-based, right? If you're not in Xamarin, right? 
Java doesn't have properties, right? There's actually a bunch of like get methods and set methods. Well, the one thing I like about .NET is properties. So Xamarin actually is smart enough to say there's that underlying get method and set method. It translates those into .NET properties. So in order to get that string, we, instead of calling explicit get method, we just use the property. And that pulls in the in string value from that. We've now got it into our cross-platform class, our silly string. Right, we now can just go ahead and access our upper count property on our silly string, and that gives us back our value. And so now we want to display it out. Right? So what we need to do is we're going to go ahead and get to our output text, which is a text view. So again, we just declare a text view in our code. We call find view, ID, excuse me, find view by ID, passing the resource ID. And then we go ahead and just set the text property on it, and it displays it out to the user. So what you're experiencing here is a kind of a merger of your coding very .NET style, your types behave very .NET style, but you're interacting with the user interface uh, in a very Android way. Now, if we look at the iOS side of the same thing, right, we're going to have our iOS UI laid out there. Right? Same fundamental concept, right? an input field, a button, and an output field. So we have our code. But remember, the key thing here is that because of the differences in the Android and iOS environments, iOS, actually, we have pre-generated properties for all our UI. So we don't have to explicitly go out and get to it. We just got the properties that were generated for us. So the same code, or the code is the same thing, actually looks quite differently, right? Is that we want to get to our button. Well, we've already got a property for our button, so we can go ahead and just link up to its event. But you notice one thing here is that it's not a click event. We're actually using a touch up inside event. And that's because in the iOS environment, there isn't a generic click event. There are different touch events. Right? There's a you know, touch down inside, touch in, up inside, and a bunch of other events. We still use the underlying event models. Right? There is a .NET event exposed for us. We can do the plus equals with a delegate, but we still have to understand the actual event types on the underlying UI. Xamarin doesn't try to translate them into some generic concept. Right? It's actually embracing the underlying event types. All right, so then from there, we go in, we use our cross-platform class, our silly string. We want to get the value user entered. So there is, for that input field, there's a generated property called input field that exposes the text property so we can get that back. We go ahead and just get our upper count. And then we want to go and display the value back out. We're going to do it to an output field. So again, we use the generated property for output field and assign the result into its text property. So again, I, I kind of keep saying this, but we're doing that, that kind of merger of ideas. Very .NET, but still leveraging the native and natural capabilities of the underlying UI. Now, if you've kind of watched much of the press about Xamarin, and if you believe a lot of the blogs that you read out there, uh, you've heard, there's something called Xamarin Forms. And Xamarin Forms is a really neat idea that was introduced in the latest edition of Xamarin. And the thing you might be asking is, well, doesn't Xamarin Forms overcome all that cross-platform UI stuff you just talked about? Because right? I kept saying that well, we're going to build our, our Android UI code one way and our iOS code, UI code another way. But if you believe a lot of the blogs out there, they're saying, no, Xamarin Forms completely overcome that. Xamarin Forms gives you a generic UI model over top of both platforms. I would encourage you to be careful about what we read. Xamarin Forms are something very powerful. Right. They are a common UI model across Android and iOS. And the idea is that they are a cross-platform UI. They are types and that provide a common concept of what a page looks like, you know, what an input text looks like, what output text looks like, what button looks like. They are a cross-platform UI. They do have a C API, right? So there's concepts like a content page. You can lay out each of your types, like a label, and it translates a label to whatever that means on Android, what it means to iOS. There's also even XAML support, right? So if you've ever worked in Silverlight XAML, there's a XAML way to describe the same thing. So you can identify things like a content page and then the content on it. One thing to be careful about is that at this point, uh, XAML UI support doesn't exist for Xamarin. Uh, there's no official statement on that, but I've never been able to get to work. I've talked to a bunch of other people. Uh, at this point, there's no XAML UI designer capability. You have to write all this code manually. I'm, I am sure that's not going to stay true for long, but it is true for right now. So that's one thing to consider. 
But I want to address the idea of where, what is the role of Xamarin Forms in our development? If it is a cross-platform UI, why, do, why are we talking about all that Android-specific stuff and iOS-specific stuff? Xamarin Forms hold a very specific role for now. Right? Xamarin Forms are really new. They've only been in kind of relief for like two weeks, two and a half weeks. But again, there's a lot of people out there who are writing blog posts about Xamarin Forms who, are, who do not have a mobile development background. And people are kind of misunderstanding the role of Xamarin Forms in their current incarnation. They have some limitations, and they don't address all of the things you run into in real-life mobile development. Not yet. I keep saying not yet because Xamarin Forms are something we want to watch really, really closely because Xamarin Forms are going to be an incredibly powerful tool, a powerful tool at some point. They're just not there right now. And if you ask me why I say that, um, part of that is just having worked with it a little bit. But let me pull out a quote from an introduction to Xamarin Forms from the Xamarin website. And one of the paragraphs there starts out saying, Xamarin Forms are written in C-sharp and allow for rapid prototyping of applications that can evolve over time to complex applications. Two key phrases in there. Rapid prototyping and evolve to complex apps. This is exactly how Xamarin themselves describe Xamarin Forms. They are great for prototyping your apps. They're great for some kind of just initial, hey, how does this work? How does this going to look? What's it going to look like on this UI? What's it going to look like on that UI? Really good for that. But when you deal with things out in the field, it's differences in devices, uh, particularly on the Android side, uh, there's a lot of things that come up that Xamarin Forms do not yet fully deal with. And again, I, I just can't say this enough. Don't write off Xamarin Forms. I'm just saying they're not there yet. They are going to evolve over time to be a more and more important part of our development. But you see, as we've talked about this, that you know, the code that doesn't tie directly to the platform, right, that stuff shares fantastically. But when you get into the UI, you have to start thinking about both environments. And again, there's a lot of issues when you try to abstract that. And I think that's why it's taken Xamarin some time to get there. But Xamarin understands mobile development really well. Uh, I really expect Xamarin Forms to eventually to evolve into a really powerful UI model that will be cross-platform for most common scenarios. But right now, it's more for kind of simple stuff and prototyping. Right? But again, keep an eye on it. So we're kind of, uh, I want to make sure I leave time for questions. So let me just kind of wrap up with uh, key things that I want you to remember from this. Again, if you have questions, I really want you to send them on to me. So either type them into your chat window, or again, you can just use Twitter, just hashtag them, throw us like live. So just to finish up before I get to the question, the key things to remember is that Xamarin is .NET tools and an environment for iOS and Android, right? So it really lets us write real .NET. It provides real .NET types, and, you, and you're writing real .NET code, but you're also writing real iOS code and real Android code. Right? I really think it's kind of a merger of really powerful environments to work effectively. When it comes to the cross-platform stuff, you really can share code across platforms. And again, those platforms include your traditional .NET environments. It can be Windows Phone. It can be ASP.NET. It can be the desktop.NET. As long as it's not things that tie into UI and platform-specific services, that code shares really well. So again, like data validation, business logic, shares really, really well. But we do still write specific code for the platforms, right? We must deal with platform specifics. UI is a big part of that. But again, specific services, specific behaviors, we still write code specific to our platforms. And then Xamarin Forms, right? It is a cross-platform UI that's at, at this point, it's for simple apps and prototyping. Again, it's going to, I'm certain before long, it's going to be a powerful tool. It's just not there quite yet. Right? So that's kind of the main thing I want you to understand. So as we finish up here, let me go ahead and go through some of our questions. Um, so one of the questions is, does, uh, from Kurt says, does Xamarin translate uh, CIL? And I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, because the code that's ultimately produced is uh, the native code for the platform. So Android code is just runs on Android. There's no runtime you go install or anything like that. That's what's real Android. Same thing like iOS, right? So that you can go ahead and uh, it's running real apps. That's why it's really compatible with the, the actual app stores and so forth. Um, so the next question is from Carlos. It says, is there Windows Phone 8 support? And the answer is sort of. And what I say about that is that Xamarin doesn't take on Windows Phone 8, right? Microsoft has that covered. And Xamarin is really .NET. So what that means is that in Visual Studio, what you can do is you can create a portable or shareable project type. Right? Put all your shared code in there. 
You can then create an Android project, an iOS project, and a Windows Phone project, link that assembly in, and then go ahead and build it, right? So you have Windows Phone code, but that part's provided by Microsoft. But because Xamarin fits so cleanly into the Visual Studio environment, uh, it's as if Xamarin has support. Because the idea that Visual, Visual Studio provided the Windows Phone 8 support, Xamarin just adds in iOS and Android to that. So you can target all three platforms with a single bit of shared code and a common development experience. So from Paulo, I have... Um, does it have a performance or other kind of cost overhead? Uh, it used to have a, a much more of a performance overhead. Um, the old, particularly on older devices and older uh, Xamarin, uh, there was there was definitely a higher runtime cost. Today, that's not really true. In fact, uh, I've seen some stats where Xamarin is actually uh, slightly faster than even kind of uh, the, the native coding. But in general, I would consider them the same in terms of runtime performance. The one bit of overhead that I, I see is that a uh, I do find the builds are a little bit longer, and uh, sometimes the points with device a little bit longer. Xamarin does a lot of stuff to try to help that. Uh, they actually kind of break out part of their runtime environment in debug mode, so that you don't have to push as much code out to your device and so forth. But the build times I do find to be a bit longer. Um, but when you actually get your apps out into the wild, um, it's a very consistent experience for users. Uh, again, uh, from current, I have, uh, can we leverage Coco using Visual Studio Xamarin UI Editor? Um, I don't know. I've never done it. Um, there are ways to pull bindings from that, so I'm sure there's a way to do it. I just don't know if it, it works out of the box. Um, so from Kurt, uh, the debugging code is in C sharp. Is it translated to C, into Objective C? When you're debugging, you're debugging in C sharp. You're actually doing source code debugging. So you will walk line by line through your code. The code ultimately runs in a native environment for the device, but your source code debugging is C sharp. Hardware acceleration, yes, it does take advantage of the underlying hardware acceleration, just like the native environments do. So, Ritesh, can I use Xamarin to create Windows tablet and phone apps? I think I kind of addressed that. But the bottom line is that you're going to use the Visual Studio and Microsoft stuff to do that. Xamarin just adds iOS and Android to that experience. So, uh, Carlos, we've got a whole bunch here. I'll get to as many of these as I can. I want to make sure I stop by one, so I'll keep going through these, but I uh, just want to make you aware if we do run out of time. Um, you can always send questions in. We can answer them kind of after the fact. So, so Carlos asked, um, do you think that Apple does put out? Um, do you think that as Apple does put out new screen size, do you think there will be multiple resources for each of the UI components? Um, I don't want to speculate on what Apple is doing there. Um, you know, Apple does a, a really good job, I think, of trying to provide consistency. But there are things we're going to have to deal with. Uh, we know that uh, when we build a uh, a Xamarin app for iOS. You can actually build it to be Windows created as a Windows, or excuse me, as an iPhone project, an iPad project, or a universal project. Um, so Xamarin is, is keeping up with whatever Apple is doing, um, but I don't know what Apple has planned in terms of their UI components to deal with screen differences. Um, so Kurt says, under the hood, is Xamarin actually translating .NET CLL code to native Android iOS? Well, what they basically do is, I'm, I'm trying to remember, I think... There is, I believe there is a CLL, CLI uh, pass through it. By the time you get there, it's not there. What actually happens is, is that um, in the environments, they come to different things. On the Android side, what they've actually done is they've actually provided their own .NET runtime, their own mono runtime, right? So it's kind of just like .NET does with garbage collection, that sort of thing. And what they actually do, it's actually pretty cool, is that um, they have their own runtime, but they also want to make sure they behave correctly. So remember that. Well, on Android, when you write your, your apps in Java, there's also an Android runtime. And so uh, Xamarin doesn't try to supplant that. Xamarin actually cooperates with that. So Xamarin actually has the concept of kind of Android callable wrappers and uh, monocallable wrappers. And so what actually happens is that your code actually uh, runs where it can inside the Xamarin runtime. But when you get to runtime-based types, things like activity, some of the sound APIs, Xamarin actually calls over into the Android runtime let that code run over there, and then the code calls, runs back, comes back into the modern runtime. On the iOS side, things are different. On the iOS side, Apple doesn't allow runtimes, right? They actually have a rule. There can be no runtimes. So on the iOS side, what they actually do is fully compile out to the native execution environment of iOS. So it runs native iOS code. And that's kind of interesting when you think about things like templates and stuff, right, is that I mean, we have the, in uh, .NET we have things like generics. Right, we can declare a type that, and not know what type, what types it uses, like an like a list or something, and then you might use it with an integer, uh, an integer type one time, right? You might use it with a string type another time, a custom type another time. 
And when you have a runtime, you can kind of hook that all up at runtime. Because iOS does not allow a runtime environment, what uh, Xamarin actually has to do is fully compile out for all your types. Right, so there, you can have a, a larger file type. You can do a lot, a lot of generic stuff. Right, but it will ultimately run in the native mode. So I want to hear from Aaron. Um, at some point, can you speak to Xamarin, for, Xamarin forums and cross-platform development? I'm actually uh, the next course. I'm actually finishing a course right now on doing Google Glance development with Xamarin. I just had one come out doing it in Java. I have one come out doing it in Xamarin. The next course I write is going to be on Xamarin forms. So we're going to get into that in great detail. Uh, Kurt. Why is diversity introduced in Xamarin as a third-party dependency for iOS cross-platform development? Um, for me, it's, it's the issue of um, fast development time. It's, um, you know, if you're only targeting iOS and you're really good at Objective-C, I'm not trying to talk you out of it. Um, but if you're working cross-platform or you, uh, you don't have Objective-C skills and you're a .NET developer, that's where Xamarin really pays off. Now, on the cross-platform side of it, I mean, the reality is, is that, yeah, you can't share all your code, but you're going to write a lot less code. With Xamarin, you have to write one whole version in Android, Java, and one whole version in Objective C. Right. The other thing is that, if, uh, obviously, I think you're a person with strong Objective C skills. If you were someone come, coming from the .NET environment, uh, not having to learn Objective C to move to iOS is a huge benefit to someone with .NET skills. Right. So, to kind of really summarize that kind of long statement, if you're cross-platform, you write less code through Xamarin. If you're only iOS and you don't have Objective C skills, you can, one can leverage their .NET skills. But again, I'm not trying to say that if, you know, if you're a good Objective-C developer and you're comfortable there, go ahead and keep doing it. No reason to step away from it. Um, one from Nate. I'm new to mobile. How does it compare to PhoneGap? Um, I've not worked directly in PhoneGap, but I'm just slightly familiar with it. Uh, PhoneGap, I believe, is a uh, JavaScript HTML abstraction, right? So you write HTML for UI, write a lot of your logic in JavaScript, and then it renders underneath. Xamarin, you're actually you're writing .NET code, and you're embracing the underlying UI. The key thing is that you get uh, more direct access to the platforms through Xamarin. Um, your apps will tend to look much more natural to the platform. Um, I, I can't really speak to what, how many features translate through. I don't know. Um, I, the one thing I do know is that, oh, I shouldn't say I do. I'm pretty sure in PhoneGap, if you have to write platform-specific code, you have to write it in the native environment. So if it's Android code in Java, your iOS code is in Objective-C. Whereas in Xamarin, you're always writing .NET. Whether it's your shared code or your platform-specific code, it's always .NET. Um, this is from Itamar. Uh, do you see a potential problem getting approval from Apple for your app when using Xamarin and, and Xamarin Forms? No, there is no problem. That is, uh, there are apps, Xamarin apps are deployable to the Apple Store. There's not a problem there at all. That was something that Xamarin did a really good job with up front. Um, one of the things that Xamarin makes them really uh, valuable is that um, Xamarin clearly has relationships with Microsoft, been very public about that, and they clearly have a relationship with Apple because in order for them to ship Xamarin support for iOS 7 the day iOS 7 came out, that's only possible for them to be working with Apple. But the bottom line is that your apps are deployable to the Apple Store and deployable to Google Play. There's nothing special you have to do that's very accepted. Um, what kind of reporting graph type controls can be used? Um, I don't know. I haven't worked on that. Um, you'll, you'll find in my bio my email address. Again, shoot me an email with that question. I'll try and find something. I haven't seen anything out there like that. Um, but I, I imagine there's something there. Uh, Albert, what are the advantages that related to startups that Xamarin gives? Uh, well, since I'm, I actually lead development for a startup, I can actually answer that one pretty well. The big thing, I think, is um, development time and, and, and time to market. Um, there are two sides to that. If you are a .NET developer, man, the time you don't have to spend learning Java or Objective-C will get you running quick, right? Um, the other thing is not duplicating code. Uh, again, we're, we're dealing with that issue right now in the project I lead, is that, uh, you know, there, there's definitely UI specifics that we do because we're trying to write a really rich UI. But there's all kinds of business rules that we have to deal with, um, hooking into our back-end service parse. Right? All that stuff is shared code. We're only writing it once. So basically, you know, we get a smaller team, and we support both platforms much faster. Right? So that's a really key thing there. Um, from Steven. Can you use universal apps to target iOS, Android, Windows Phone, and Windows Store apps? Um, a single universal app, not anything that does real-life stuff. Uh, maybe, maybe some limited things you can do with a window, with Xamarin Forms for some prototyping stuff. But an app I was, that had kind of rich capabilities I was sending out to the field, not at this time. Um, but uh, I expect that there will be a day when that is true. 
from someone else named Jim. As we term, can I use just Xamarin Studio for both Android and iOS development? Yes, you can use just Xamarin Studio for both Android and iOS development. One thing to be clear about, though, um, there, it, it's an issue of pricing. Um, there is one when you when you buy Xamarin, even even the uh, indie edition, you buy one copy for iOS and one copy for Android. Right, so there's kind of a purchasing issue there. Um, if you use the free starter edition, you still get two, but they're free. So the idea is that you can use Xamarin Studio for both environments, absolutely. Uh, there's just some issues the way licensing works when you purchase it. Right. Um, let me check the time. Okay, so we're going to have about four minutes left. I'm going to get through as many of these as I can, um, and then we'll try to figure out a way to kind of get the information posted. Maybe a blog post or something will answer some of these others. Uh, so for Mimi, can you point to a good sample app that I've written for iOS, Android, and Windows Phone 8? Or is your number app available to download somewhere? Uh, I'm, it, it may not be available now, but um, I will make it available. Um, I'm going to cover the iOS and Android side of it, um, but if you know Windows Phone 8, extending it to that would be should be quite simple. Uh, but I'll, I'll work with Pluralsight to make sure we get that posted somewhere. From JC, um, in a hybrid app, can I use open source like HiCarts? Um, if it's .NET, yeah, uh, it should work fine. Uh, I can't I can't validate HiCarts specifically. I don't know exactly what you're doing. But I have used uh, a number of .NET open source things that are not specific to Xamarin, and they've worked fine. Um, so I can't speak to high charts specifically, but um, most .NET code that does not DUI stuff will work fine. That might be the one thing that I'm thinking about. Something named high charts makes me think it's UI based. So there, there's probably a good chance that that may not work, but I, I don't know for sure. Uh, for Marco. Uh, what about business logic data things that are platform specific? Uh, Compact SQL, WebSockets, REST clients can that be shared? Well, it kind of depends, right? Is that uh, like for your web, for, for some of the web stuff that you know you can use the standard .NET HTTP class? Uh, I know uh, there's actually for most of the SQL code, if you're using a Compact SQL, that actually works just fine. Um, again, I'm thinking of REST clients. If you're actually using the HTTP, higher level HTTP APIs, uh, they would work fine. I should say lower level HTTP APIs. In terms of higher level APIs, it's going to depend on the client. Like, for example, I use Parse in the project that I lead. Um, Parse actually provides a Xamarin wrapper for their features. So, literally, I can share that code across iOS and Android. Um, there are also ways to do bindings so you can actually bring things into Xamarin. So, uh, it would depend on the specific one you're working on. All right, probably maybe two or three more is all I'm going to have time to get to. I'm sorry. Um, can I use this is from Brian? Can you use Xamarin Forms? Uh, for simple screens such as log in conjunction with iOS, Android specific, or more complex screens. You know, that is something I have not explored specifically yet. Um, it's something I'm working on understanding better now. I don't want to say for sure. Uh, watch the Pluralsight blog and my blog. I'll get you a better answer to that uh, soon. I know that Xamarin Forms does definitely have ways to customize behavior, so it seems doable. I just don't know how much work is behind it at this point. I haven't had a chance to explore it. Um, Charbel, uh, is Xamarin going to review their licensing costs at some point? I can't answer that. I don't have an insight on that. The one thing I will tell you is that um, if you have an MSDN subscription, um, you get a big discount on Xamarin between 30 and 50 percent. And if you're going, well, geez, an MSDN subscription is too expensive, check out BizSpark. Right? Uh, BizSpark is uh, something Microsoft offers for startups. They give you a three-year free subscription to MSDN. So that's what you can do with a startup, right? So you get, um, or you know, you can, a startup can be kind of your own thing you're doing, right? Is that Get your free BizPark subscription by contacting Microsoft. That gives you three years free MCN, and that gets you 30 to 50 percent off of Xamarin. So that's the best answer I can give you to that now. So let me give you the, this guy's be the last one because we're just about out of time. Um, again, I'll cooperate. I'll work with Pluralsight to try and get the rest of these answered and posted somehow. Uh, this is from AIC Developers. Where do you place SQL.net code when working both Android and iOS? Um, I would do that in a shared project. Uh, I mean, I haven't. I'm trying to think about that go, but you should be able to do that in a. Um, um, but like a portable project, right? So that you can actually do that, either portable or shareable. One of those two. It's going to depend on the underlying details. One of those two should do it. Right. Uh, I'm going to answer one more from Dennis. Do the Xamarin Forms have a specific look and feel, a specific platform? Yes, they do. The cool thing they do is that they translate it to the native underlying stuff. And in fact, they have cool hooks in there for you to kind of get your own stuff in there. So yeah, it will look native to the platform. Right. Uh, I'm sorry, that's all I'm going to have time to answer today. Again, I'll cooperate with Pluralsight. Um, to try to get answers these guys posted somehow. I really appreciate everyone's time today. I, I know you guys are really busy. Well, then I'm going to hand it off to Dana.